Shakespeare's structural decision to start the play with the witches suggests that they are important characters, but there is also an immediate sense of mystery and confusion given that we arrive at the end of their meeting. The first witch opens the play's dialogue with the enigmatic When Shall We Three Meet Again? Shakespeare is clever in his construction here, prompting our curiosity about what role the witches will take in the play, but also helping to set the scene for what is to come. Macbeth is a murky world filled with confusion, and in a play where a major theme is the difference between appearances versus reality, the audience is immediately on their guard in this ambiguous opening, unsure as to what is happening. This lack of clarity in the introduction to the witches foreshadows a major question which hangs over the entire play. Who, if anyone, persuades Macbeth to kill King Duncan? This was a topic explored in a 2010 Oxford University lecture by Dr Emma Smith, who pointed out that in the play's opening scene, the witches seem to know what is happening, when the battle's lost and won, and also where to meet Macbeth upon the heath. However, the question raised is does that mean they're able to draw him to them, or simply that they know where he will be? Smith asks, is their power therefore the power of prophecy or of direction? In other words, are they able to predict the future or to make things happen? We'll explore this further in our analysis of Act 1, Scene 3, but for now let's consider just one point. The witch's first appearance is shrouded in mystery and confusion, symbolising how their role in Macbeth's future actions is equally unclear. The scene closes and we as the audience are none the wiser about what is happening. The last lines, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air, seem to present the idea that this is a frightening, mysterious world where the supernatural holds some power. This line introduces the motif of appearances versus reality, which we will encounter time and time again in the play. The witch's line literally suggests that what appears to be good might be harmful, and what appears to be harmful might be good. When we add this statement to the fact that the audience has no idea what the witches were doing, we're immediately unsure both as to what is happening and how to feel about it. Whatever the answer, the inclusion of witches would have been a huge draw to the Jacobean audience. The witches introduced the theme of the supernatural when, in Jacobean times, practising witchcraft was a crime punishable by death. King James was particularly interested in the subject, and is estimated to have been responsible for the burning of hundreds of alleged witches. He wrote a book on the topic, Demonology, so beginning the play with this scene is therefore not only a good way to grab the interest of a contemporary audience, but also of the king, who was an important source of revenue. King James, who was already King of Scotland at the time, came to power in England in 1603. Now, most scholars believe Macbeth was written two or three years later, and the King was a big fan of the theatre, and actually became a patron of Shakespeare, whose acting troupe changed its name from the Chamberlain's Men to the King's Men. Throughout this play, then, we see signs that Shakespeare was trying to impress his patron. In this opening scene, we see this through the use of witches, as well as the obvious fact that the play is set in Scotland, where King James was from. When the witches speak in scene one, they speak in rhyming couplets, pairs of lines which rhyme at the end. Shakespeare used the language in his plays to signify the importance or rank of the person speaking. For example, all of the nobles in Macbeth speak in iambic pentameter. This is where a line has five pairs of syllables, each pair made up of one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. For an example, and fixed his head upon our battlements. The line consists of five iams, a pair of syllables with one stressed and the other unstressed, and this gives an even almost sing-song quality to the lines. If you replace the actual words from these examples, they sound like this. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. Now, this is known as blank verse. A lot of Shakespeare's writing is in blank verse. It simply means lines that don't rhyme but are written in iambic pentameter. Certain characters, such as the witches, don't use iambic pentameter, and we should consider why this is significant. When the witches speak in Act 1, Scene 1, they do so in rhyming couplets, pairs of lines that rhyme at the end, and this means their dialogue sounds different to that of the other characters. It has the rhythm of a spell or a chant. Now, it's difficult to appreciate the effect of these witches now, in the 21st century. To a modern audience, the rhyming and spells can often come across as silly or humorous, but this would not have been the case for Shakespeare's audience. 
The form used by the witches is trochaic tetrameter. Again, this is quite easy to understand once you break it down. A troche is the opposite of an iam, whereas the iam contains a pair of syllables with the first one unstressed and the second stressed, a troche is the other way round, a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable. For example, fair is foul and foul is fair. In this line, you stress fair, foul, foul, fair. And if you replace the actual words from the above example, it sounds like dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. The word tetrameter just means there are four pairs of these trochees. The trochaic tetrameter added to the rhyming couplets makes for an entertaining scene and a clear break on Shakespeare's part between the witches and the other characters in the play. The weird sisters are different to the other characters, and so the way they speak is also different, and this creates a clear divide between the witches and the other characters in the play, emphasising their supernatural nature. Everything I go through in this video can be found in the third edition of Mr. Brusk's Guide to Macbeth, which I'll link in the description, and if you found it useful, please do subscribe to the channel.